now on Sports Day. Full on footy analysis with Daniel Hoyne. Thanks to Champion Data, the story behind the game. And he's sitting in the chair as always, Hoyne. Welcome to you. Hello, G. Hello, Kane. You've had a Hello. busy couple of days, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's a busy. Uh... It's a busy 30-week campaign, to be honest. So what are we, 11 weeks in and we've got um, 19 to go. Not that we're counting. Oh, but, it's a marathon. Um, <laughs> it is. Well, it tell is. me this. Who's the second best side in it if uh, Collingwood's the best side and uh, your observations on those sides in the eight at the present time as far as premiership contention? Because one, for instance, would be Melbourne. The only side they've beaten in the eight right now are the Bulldogs, who uh, weren't flying at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. So for me, I'm seat one A on the Brisbane bus. I don't. You said that last. I week. don't think the gap between Collingwood and the rest is as big as what everyone um, assumes at the moment. Um, and I think Brisbane are yeah perfectly positioned at the moment. I thought that game against Adelaide, you know, Adelaide and Adelaide right now is probably one of the hardest road trips in the game, and they did quite a lot right to have 66 entries um, on um, on Sunday um, and kick one goal nine in the third quarter. Could have been a lot different um, as, as a result. So um, I wouldn't be too worried if I'm Brisbane in terms of what happened on Sunday. Okay, Geelong, where do you sit there? I think Geelong are too far gone okay. now. I think, um, yeah, I think they've got they've got issues in terms of how they're playing, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, but injuries, injuries as well. I mean, yeah, that just becomes a tipping point, I think, for too many. And um, yeah, and one many. final one this time last year, you didn't think Melbourne would win the flag. No, and that's, what about Collingwood this year? And that's why I, this might sound controversial. That's why I'm just a little bit. I think Collingwood are going to have to buck history, mm -hmm. if you like, um, to win it. I mean, we've seen over the last nine years, we've seen only one team who who is the best team in the competition at this stage of the year win the flag, and that was Melbourne in 21. So there's a long time for the competition to uh, to sit back and analyse one team who everyone thinks is the best team in the comp at the moment, and they're going well, no doubt about that. It's a long time to be a sitting duck. That's all. And we've seen Hawthorne and Richmond and Geelong last year and um, and, and West Coast, you know, to a degree in 2018, not be the best team in the competition right now. Just be hovering and then get their game going. So it's um, – Collingwood can do it. I'm not saying that they can't, uh, but they're going to have to buck history, if you like. I think we'll change the metaphor. It's a long time to be a hot pie. <laughs> That's the creativity <laughs> there, G. I haven't got the creativity with me, so well done. Oh, what, what about the wild cards, though, Horny? Well, I know we've got a lot to get through. I've got the piece yeah. of paper here, and we always run out of time. So it's just a couple of quick observations on the wild cards. Frio. No, I think Frio's game is, is going okay, but it's a long way off from being a, um, being a sustainable brand. Adelaide. No, I like what Adelaide are doing. I think Adelaide, uh, of the teams in that in that you know, s you know, six to ten bracket at the moment, clearly has the best profile to be able to challenge for a top four berth. All right. I think we... Uh, Lawrence is getting some... nervous. What we needed to is getting very nervous. We'll start with your first observation, and it just says 10 seconds, that'll kill you. Yeah, so this part of the game, to me, on the eye, is becoming more and more crucial, and is starting to decide more and more results. And the reason why I call it the 10 seconds that kill you is the defensive 50 stoppage. So it's, mm. it's really, by the time the, the umpire throws a ball up, there's 10 seconds there as the defensive team to kill that contest and get the ball out of goal. Yep. So to put this into context, right, so each, each game, a team only averages one goal per game from a forward 50 stoppage. So it should be a minimal yep. um, you know, defensive return, if you like, yep. a, a, as the defensive teams. But we're seeing constantly now over, over you know, a, a period of weeks that this phase of the game is actually deciding matches. It's killed Melbourne the last couple of weeks. It's hasn't killed it? Geelong the last two weeks. Mm. So Geelong have lost two games in a row to GWS and Fremantle as a result of D50 stoppages. So again, you, you concede one goal per game. Geelong conceded six against Fremantle in a game decided by four goals. That's the difference in the game. And concede four to GWS in a game decided by one goal. Mm. That's the difference in the game. Um, Melbourne conceded six goals or seven goals, whatever it was, um, to, um, to Port Adelaide two weeks ago in a game decided by four points. Yep. That's the difference in the game. They conceded two goals against Fremantle on the weekend in a game decided by a goal. Over the last two weeks, they've, uh, sorry, over the last four weeks, they've conceded 11 goals in that, um, in that period. Think back to the Swans. Toby Green kicks that goal yep. with 40 seconds to go from a Ford 50 stoppage. They don't concede that goal. They're sitting six and five, and they're probably seventh on the ladder, and we're probably talking about them in a, in a different way. Think back to grand final day last year. Geelong get going mm. as a result of two Ford 50 stoppage goals, Tom and Hawkins. all of a sudden the momentum gets going. So 
this phase of the game, I think, is becoming more and more important, and you've just got to be so switched on if you're, the de- if you're the defensive team. It was really interesting listening to Matthew Nick speak about that and the pride in his group to be able to defend that aspect of the game. I'm not sure if you, you heard it, Horny. Yeah. I'm sure you did. You don't miss too much. But he, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but the amount they were able to absorb of those D50 stoppages, and it led to one goal, I think. 30 defensive 50 stoppages they had to defend Adelaide. Mm, mm. Gave up one goal. Yeah. In a tight game mm. all night, to do, you know, to concede one goal in that phase of the game is a large reason why they win the game. And now they're sitting six and five as opposed to five and six. And we're probably talking about them slightly differently mm. to what we actually are at the moment. So it, it's, you know, in a small margin industry, as Kingy keeps talking about, it is such a crucial phase of the game that's really hurting um, a few teams at the moment. Good start, Dalhorny. A really strong start. Let's get into your seven main talking points. And you want to begin with Sam Walsh. Yeah, so just sitting back on watching um, Walsh so far this year and you know I understand that he's coming off um, you know an injury interrupted preseason if you like but the impact that he's having on matches from a ball use perspective and we've and, and we've spoken about this um, you know for a fair bit this season mm. but this is actually now a common theme with Walsh's career so far so so far this year in terms of the impact that he's having from a ball use perspective it's 252nd in the competition that's a mile off but yeah, but as I said, it's not a common theme. Last year he was 187th for impact um, with ball use. 2019, 323rd. 20, uh, 2020, 172nd. The only season where he's sort of been relatively damaging with ball in hand was 2021, where he was a 54th highest rated player for um, for ball in hand. If you were his coach, what would you be instructing? Well, the interesting phase with that, if I can just get back to that 2021 season, the damage was coming with hands. Mm. It wasn't coming through ball use by foot. So the impact that he was having by hand in 2021 was the 14th best of any player in the competition. This year, it's 322nd. So it's. I think they need to change him to be that handball and release player and actually get the ball to the outside and get the ball in Saad's hands, get the ball in Newman's hands and get the ball in those more, in, in those more damaging players' hands as opposed to him where I think a lot of people think that he should be the outside mm. ball user, creativity type. Well, his career suggests that's not him. That's Can you him. delve into it just a little bit um, in more detail as to what he's letting him down? So when you say he, his ball use is 252nd, what aspect of it? Is he missing the kicks that he should hit? Is he taking the easier ones? Just so two phases. Yeah, so two phases. And that's a fair question. So his field kicking, in terms of when he actually does try to take on um, a more damaging kick, he's not getting the returns from it. So then when he actually does win it on the outside, when he is getting the returns, it's the safer, lateral, shorter mm. option. That's not really impacting um, the play, if you like. You're not looking at it thinking, oh, well, you know, Carlton are in a better position here to actually score next, if you like. Getting the ball on the outside, going lateral, going short to an uncontested teammate doesn't really put you in a better position to score next. So people listening to that, particularly Carlton supporters and people watching Carlton, like me, would say, but he's kicking it into a crowded forward line. Now, the explanation I assume from you is we take that into consideration. Yeah, no, we do. So if, you, if you're kicking at 50 metres down the line to a contest, yep. your expected hit rate is pretty low. Yep. So that's okay. Yep. So we take that into consideration as well. So if, if he kicks it long down the line um, and, and, you know, and it results in a, um, in a stoppage or you know, his teammate winning possession, he's going to get highly rated for that. Um, so that gets actually taken into account as well. Now, my memory has it you had similar numbers for Paddy Cripps only a few weeks ago. So if you've got uh, – is that true? from memory? In terms of his ball use? Yeah. yeah, so his ball use is poor, and we've talked about this a little bit on the show. Chera's yeah. the one. Chera and That's Saad right. yeah. are, the, are the two where they've got to get those those players the ball and feed them the ball as much as they possibly can. Moving right know. along, Horny, otherwise we'll get bogged down. We've got a lot to get Lawrence. through. The Saints, have they been worked out? Yeah, so I just wanted to just put it on the Saints defenders, um, if you like. So we talked a little bit, probably about round five, round six. Um, in terms of their work, once the ball actually left, um, left the stoppage, it was, the, it was up there with the best teams in the competition, mm. along with Collingwood, in terms of their ability to be able to win the contested possession in that phase of the game. Now that's gone to 13th over the last six weeks. 
but but where it's actually coming from is is their work and inability to be able to win contests in their defensive fifty. So Cal Wil- so Cal Wilkie, Josh Battle, and Dougal Howard are the ones where their where their contest work has really dropped off over the last six weeks. So the three of them all ranked in the top twenty players in the competition mm. after round five for winning contests in the defensive fifty in general play. Now Wilkie's gone from number four in the competition to twentieth. Battle's gone from you know, 11th to about 15th in the competition, so he hasn't dropped off too much. But Howard's the one. Howard's gone from 14th to 80th. Mm. And he's, his ability to, to not be able to hold up in a one-on-one contest has really fallen away. Wilkie's inability to be able to hold up in a one-on-one contest has fallen away um, as well. So, so they are getting challenged through their inability to be able to, to defend ball movement um, through the midfield of the, yep. of the ground. But then when the ball gets into that defensive 50, we didn't see them exposed in the first five weeks of the season. So those three players are, um, are, are just on notice. How much of it here. is due to a lack of pressure from St Kilda up the ground? I think a, I think a fair bit of it is is to do with teams being able to pick apart, um, you know, St Kilda's defensive structure through the midfield of the ground. Mm. But you still got to be able to then be able to ro- um, rely on on your defenders to yep. be able to hold up and to be able to win those contests. The Giants. The yeah, just wanted to give GWS a fair bit of credit in terms of what they've been able to do so far this year. So only once have they actually been involved in a game decided by over four goals. So yep. ten of their eleven games have been um, have been so. So competitive um, in terms of what they're doing. And, you know, just the way that Adam Kingsley is wanting this team to play is suited to the list and, and, and the recruiting model that they've been able to sort of implement over the last 12 months. So if you look at the fourth half of the ground, yes, Toby Green is an absolute superstar. Brent Daniels is having an absolutely brilliant, yeah, brilliant season. And I thought he was the reason why they won that game in the fourth quarter. I thought Toby set the game up in the first half. He won the game in the All second Australian half. All-Australian squad, brilliant. Yep, absolutely, yeah. at the Ooh. moment. Um, Toby Bedford, good recruit from Melbourne. We haven't seen this guy yet, Darcy Jones at pick 21, who's done his knee, another small little mm-hmm. forward. So, you, so you're understanding the way that Adam Kingsley wants to play. They handball the fourth most of any team in the competition. They go forward the fourth most of any team in the competition. They've got, they've got these magnets in the fourth half of the ground to play the chaotic brand of footy, which we saw that against Geelong on the yep. weekend. They then have the magnets behind the ball in Sam Taylor, who's not there at the moment. And we, saw, and we saw what Jack Buckley did on the weekend and what he's done across the course of the season. They've got a lot going for them. They've been the sixth least experienced team across the course of the season. Mm. And I think if you're, if you're assessing GWS, you're assessing GWS from a 2025 um, perspective. Yep. 2025 is a year where you're looking at, the, at this demographic and this team, and that's the year where you should be expecting them to launch and to challenge for a top six position. They're doing a lot right um, at the moment in a lot of phases. Been a lot of feedback for the Demons, some questioning uh, the validity of their wins and whether it's been against the quality teams or not, and perhaps it hasn't, Horny. How do you see them? Yeah, well, yeah, there is a lot of talk about them at the moment you know, on, on the back of what you said, Kane, but they've lost... They've lost two games interstate against Brisbane in Brisbane and Port in Port. Like they're, they're pretty challenging, pretty challenging yep. matches. And as I said, you know, they lost against Port Adelaide on the back of defending D50 stoppage poorly and on the back of defending D50 stoppage poorly against Brisbane. So just little phases of the game have, have killed them in those two matches. I talk a lot about the turnover game being king. Mm. And 17 of the last 18 premiers have ranked top three in the turnover game. The reason why we talk about it is that, you know, close to 60% of your score comes from turnover. You have double the opportunities to score from turnover than what you do from clearance. So if your game is not in good shape in that phase, forget about it. Melbourne at the moment, this year, at round 11, a number one at scoring from turnover a number one at defending turnover, and as a result, have the best turnover game in the competition. That is the number one indicator that I go to first and foremost to assess if your game is in good shape. Doesn't get much better than that. Mm. Seven and four, don't panic. You're doing you're doing a lot right. That game on the weekend, based on expected scores, they should have won by three goals. Yep. Accuracy hurt them. Mm. Yes, accuracy has been their friend um, at times this year, but accuracy hurt them. They've got a percentage of 134%. Percentage, I think, is the number one indicator in terms of if you're going, if, if, you know, in terms of what the actual win-loss record actually yep. really looks like. It's the best percentage in the competition at the moment. So, in terms of what they're doing from a ball movement perspective, it's fine. In terms of what they're doing from a contest perspective, it's fine. The issue at the moment is defending stoppages. And if I think back to Geelong at the same stage last year, their profile was very similar to Melbourne. 
their number one issue was defending stoppages. I'd rather have that as your number one issue. Yep. You can fix that. You can tidy that up as opposed to have the turnover game as your issue at the moment. Mm. So I, I and, and people will say, yes, they've had an easy draw. Well, yeah, you can only play who, who you've actually been given. Yep. So I think I think their game is not in as bad a shape yes. as what some people actually think, I think at the moment. Yep, I think Jared and I are both with you on that one. What are you noticing with the progression of Sam Mitchell's Hawks? I think we need to retitle Hawthorne to the handballing Hawks. Okay. Um, okay. So we haven't we haven't seen a team handball like this for close to fifteen years. Mm. Their their last four weeks, they're going at two hundred and four kicks and two hundred and four handballs on the dot. Not not even the dogs. Not even no, the, no 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 they're no. handball they're handballing handballing more than the dogs in sixteen and the dogs yeah you know, and the dogs did handball a lot that year as well. So I, I think I think what they're doing, like if you're a Hawthorne supporter, yep. all you're looking for is a brand and a method yep. that you're trying to implement under Sam Mitchell at the moment. So you go along to a Saturday or a Sunday and sit down and watch this team at the moment. You know what you're trying to do. You're trying to flick the ball around by hand. You're trying to gain meterage by hand. And you're trying to actually exploit the opposition through that method. So having a point of difference is significant. So as a result of changing to being this handballing Hawthorne, team that they are, they're now able to get bang for buck from their clearance game. You've spoken about their clearance game a lot on Fox this year, yep. G, in terms of their ability to be able to win clearance, but then not be able to get scoreboard return. They're now getting the fourth most um, points off, sc- mm-hmm. um, off clearance as a result. Their ball movement is the third best in the competition. They're taking on Corridor the third most in the competition. It's a significant point of difference that they have. And I think yeah, just hats off to Sam Mitchell because it could have been easy to go down a more defensive route and they haven't and they're playing aggressive um, attacking footy. Port Adelaide are on the agenda. Hoyne, I, I don't have as much confidence in their premiership credentials as some others, but uh, what are the numbers telling you? Yeah, I, I agree with you um, in part there, Kane. I mean, you know, getting back to the turnover game at the moment, they've got the seventh best, t- um, seventh best turnover game in the competition. So it's not too bad, but it is a fair way off that bracket of top three um, that history says that you need to be at the moment. But um, I just wanted to talk about their ball movement and, and, and their ability to be able to move the ball from coast to coast and, and how that's actually improved over the last couple of weeks. And it was really noticeable. I'm not sure what you thought, Kane, sitting there on um, on Sunday watching it. You know, their ability to, and, and want to be able to take corridor and, and, mm. and go... Mm. Um, you know, you know, with such aggressive ball use. I mean, mm. you know, Horn Francis at times on, on Sunday, I thought was some really dangerous kicks yes. back into the back into the corridor. But the eyes are always a, an absolute dead giveaway, I reckon. Yep. In terms of you know what you've actually been instructed to do, and so often you see their first look is to is you know is that inboard kick and whether or not they actually go for it or not. But that first look is absolute giveaway. So the last six weeks. They are the number one ball movement team in the competition. So their ability to be able to take it from end to end is the best of any mm-hmm. team in the cor- um, in the competition, and they do so by taking corridor the third most of any team in the competition. So that was a that was a little bit of a watch on them in the first five weeks. They were twelfth in terms of their ability to be able yep. to take um, the ball from one end of the ground to the other. And we know how important the territory game is is for them. I mean, that's where their scoring is largely on the back of their ability to be able to get the ball in the forward half, lock it through stoppage or win it back off the opposition. Their ability to be able to score in the forward half of the ground is streets ahead of anyone else in the competition. So now they have two modes in which they can actually get that territory game. They can get that territory game through clearance. So the clearance game is still top six in the competition. Mm. But now if their clearance game is off for whatever reason, they now have the ability to be able to get um, territory through their transition game. So I think you know you're always looking at you're always looking at teams having to have multiple modes in which they can get you because the chances are come preliminary final weekend or, or grand final weekend at some stage the game is actually going to go against you. So if it's not going according to plan A, have you got the ability to be able to have a plan B to be able to get the game on your terms? And and that's the um, that's the main positive that I'm seeing at the moment from um, from Port Adelaide. Well, they've got some really good kickers. Um, I'm just trying to think who, who did they move? Uh, Miles Bergman, his movement to the half back. Mm. He's such a beautiful kick, Kane. I think that certainly yeah. helped them uh, in their transition game. They actually had to move him forward. They forward. Had swap. Yeah. They couldn't get anything out of Ryan Burton, mm. so he started forward, but they did the, the swapsy and, and put Bergman forward. He nearly kicked goals over two on like score it. review, but no, I'm, I'm with you. They look a lot safer when yep. he's... And you need more than one interceptor. Yep. Yep. And Ali is getting the best opposition forward. He took five on the weekend, which was a huge result, and a lot of their ball movement came off some of his defensive plays. But Bergman is... 
is a defender, and when they get Charlie Dixon back, yep. I mean, that's going to help with their key targets yep. in front of the ball. I love a game of guess who, Warney. Let's do it. Yeah, well, Kane in the ad break here, G, was, uh, he was he was just he was scrounging. Stopped. He was scrounging for the <laughs> answer. He oh, was absolutely no. scrounging. So the guess who tonight is who is on track for the best season as a wingman that we have seen in seven years. Ever. Seven years in seven years. The best um, season we've seen by a wingman since 2016. There's there's two that spring to mind. I'm because it's a trick question, so I'm going to go with Mason Wood. He's up there. He's rated very highly, but he's not the answer. Not a bad guess though. Dacos, Josh, high, high, but not not the answer. We're getting a few SMSs about this guy, so I think a few of our fans. My might be happy uh, with this. my initial consideration were the two boys from Collingwood, and then I plucked one uh, that I saw on the weekend. And he was his numbers are extraordinary at the present time in Lockie is Shoal. It, it, yeah, he was he was very good on the weekend, but he's not the answer. Oh. It's not er, it's not Errol, is it? No, it's not Errol. It's not Errol. Oh. I'll give the answer away. Gee, the please, player please who do. is having the best season as a wingman since twenty sixteen is Nick Martin. <laughs> wow. So he and I know that I can just see on the text machine here that there are a few questions about Nick Martin and not getting mentioned, so I'll hopefully they're gonna be happy with this <laughs> at the moment. So so he's so he he's improved and I know you like the percentages here, Jim. Yeah. He he's improved eighty three percent this year in terms of the impact that That's he's Having, oh, yep. having on matches this year. And he, he's, in terms of rating him against wingman um, at the moment, he's top two for ball use. So his ability to be able to impact the yep. game through ball use. But then he's also top four in his ability to be able to impact the game as a winger through his ball winning capabilities. So he, he's a two dimensional player at the moment. And he's, he's scoreboard returns in terms of the, um, you know, the amount of goals that he's kicking, the, you know, the amount of score involvements that he's been able to generate as well. He's such a dynamic player and so important in terms of what Essendon are going to be able to do in the second half of the year. This year. is going to be a real test for you all Australian selectors, Kane, because you can't live and die by the stats numbers when it suits you. You're either all in or you're not in. <laughs> We've got Kane but on board. But it, but it, <laughs> does, take, it does take away um, some of the, the opinion. Ba- like if it was just... The numbers. I understand just, that, you, but we're just, talking. You, you just hand it over to Champion Data. No, to do I understand yours. So that. So there needs to be the balance of both. Yes, we will use. but we're talking about a record. This is a record. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to downplay us, but I'm 100 percent with Kane on this. We are a, we are a part of the yeah, overall story. God. We're not the whole. We're not the whole story. A very but, useful um, guide, and it's only around 11. So I yeah. think we had still Sidebottom as the number one rated ringman maybe three or four weeks ago. And yeah, no, he was. He was changed. Yeah, injury injury hurt him on the yep. weekend um, as well. So things can change. Change. Who's Things third best? Has uh, Mason Wood had the title earlier in the year? That. I'll have to get that for you. I'm okay. to get that for you in the ad break. Would but, you be um, disappointed if Jordan Dawson was named on the wing in the All Australian team? You two? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Done. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty convincing. <laughs> I, was to, I was trying to just work my way around, <laughs> around that. Uh, we do this each and every week, and we find out who the coaches miss. So the coaches' votes come in, and then you tell us who was unlucky not to get recognised by the coaches. Yeah, so we start with the Friday night game, and Sam Wicks um, was unlucky not Quick to Wicks. get... Quick Wicks. Yeah, so yeah, we had him as the second highest rated player yeah. on the ground, and only Rankin was a higher rated general forward for the weekend uh, just gone. So pretty complete uh, performance, given that he was assigned Adam Sard for a large um, a large portion of that night. So 16 disposals, eight score involvements, two, um, two goals for him as well. So he was, uh, that was a fantastic addition to the team on the weekend. Who did, hey, you, did you like, sorry, Jared, you go first. Who did you rate highest out of Blakey or Chad Warner? Nah, Blakey by a long way. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, but we had Blakey miles ahead as a whole. Oh, he's, the ground. Oh, he's one of my favourites. Um, Should have got the I was going to ask you about the move of Zach Heaney on ball and the difference in terms of his on-ball minutes versus forward as opposed to the first 10 games of the year. Yeah, so his ratings on the weekend were actually okay um, as, a, as a midfielder. And you know, that's sort of really the only first time that we've seen for the season large, you know, large midfield minutes um, mm, yep. on the weekend. So it will, it will be interesting for us to be able to track that over the next couple of weeks if he does play that same role to see if he's actually, actually having the same amount of impact. I think for him to be able to be a, a regular Midfielder, he's got to do what he did on the weekend against the best opposition. Mm, yeah, mm. Uh, it was effective um, at times. Um, yeah, he did get hurt a couple of times going back the other way, but it will be interesting mm. to see what they do with him moving forward. I like it because he can 
then go forward and get yeah. a mismatch and, and he's got the smarts to do that which mm. is what the best midfielders are doing uh, there was a player at Hawthorne that didn't get love he's having a good season this guy yeah no he's going under the radar I think and that's James Warple so we had him as the third highest rated player on the ground on the weekend he didn't get a vote um, but you know this is what the ratings love and this is what we sort of value highly is just the impact that you have on matches so 24 disposals but he was involved in 12 scores mm. so you know 12 scores 5 score assists both career high numbers for him so you know, the damage that he's been able to have and, um, and and really produce in his game this year from from fewer disposals that, that we probably saw back in 2019 when yep. he won the BNF um, has been um, has been really impressive. Tom Sparrow? Yeah, so this is this is probably the definition of a game that you probably need to go back and watch in replay mm. to appreciate um, and, and understand the value that he actually had in this game on the, um, on the weekend. So we had him as the highest rated player on the ground um, in, in the Melbourne Frio game. From only eighteen, um, from only eighteen disposals. So mm. it, it was a it was a, it was a nice balance in terms of what he was able to do, both from a ball use perspective and a ball winning perspective. Yeah. And I was actually really surprised, to be honest, when I saw him as the highest rated player in the mm. ground. And I, I just went back and watched his edits, and you could actually understand what he was so clean yep. around the contest and his ability to be able to impact um, with, with ball in hand was extremely um, extremely impressive. How's Grundy? How's his year been? His year was good when Max wasn't playing. Right. So that's um, that's the interesting watch for us as a whole at the moment is sort of understanding They're the They're not complimenting each no, other. No, not at the moment. As Max's year been? Disappointing compared to what he's been able to produce previously. I mean, mm. this is the first time this season that he's performing below expectation as a ruckman. Who have um, you got as a number years. one ruckman in the comp right now? Uh, good question. I'll have, to, I'll have to ask you. I've got English here down for later on, so that's an interesting okay, discussion. Okay, we'll come but, back to that. Um, yeah, Let's so, talk, talk about the next guy that you've got written down because the names for the rising stars uh, Sheasel, oh. Ashcroft, Jinby Owens, Mike Alaney, um, Philip Ho, Weddle's been impressive, and this is the latest nominee. What about the other young bloke down at uh, St Kilda? Owens, yeah, yeah Owens. Owens is in there. Owens, yeah, yeah. as well. And, and, but this guy's been amazing, what he's doing. Kane, good Humphrey. luck. Good luck trying to actually uh, yeah, work out who the rising star is. At the moment, so yeah, so Bailey Humphrey, we had him as the third highest rated player um, on the ground. We actually had him as the fifteenth highest rated yeah. player. For Surprised the round. he didn't get a vote. No, nah, so if, you know, the fifteenth highest rated player across the whole round. Only Raoul and, and Lacosas were actually rated higher than him. Um, and and I think if you if you want to get an understanding in terms of what the ratings actually value, just go and watch his last goal. Yep. Where you know the match winning goal. So that 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 crumb, that loose ball crumb, and we talk about the loose ball being king. Yep. Mm. So and and then the goal. So that that there that that one act alone is a significant ratings impact. And that's um, yeah. If you just want to understand that, just have a look at that last goal that he kicked on the weekend. I don't think the uh, general public understand as much as they should. Loose ball. It's actually a contested ball. Yeah. So if you want to if you want to have a look at that goal, you'll see you'll see how he wins it. So there's no one around him, but that still is in is in a contest, and that's a clear definition of what a loose ball get is. And then that allows him the time to mm. make an effective and damaging decision with ball in hand. So let's get to your gem, Horny. What do you got this week? Yeah. So the gem is around Collingwood. Um, so last year there was a lot of talk around their contested possession game, ground ball game, and how they were actually winning games. So they were minus eleven ground ball per game yep. um, last year, which was seventeenth or eighteenth in the competition. This year they're plus six for ground ball differential, which is a top four, top five um, ground ball profile. But that swing of 17 ground ball differential mm. from one season to the next is the biggest swing that we've ever recorded from one mm. season to the next. Any specific so, outside of Mitchell? Who else has improved? No, well, yeah, so Dacos is high up in this. Yep. Jack Crisp is high up in this. They've just got a nice even spread nice in terms of what they've been able to do in the ground ball game, which is why they've sort of elevated their game from last year to this year. You got and a horror? horror? Yeah, the horror is just looking at the four players at the moment whose form has decreased the most of any players um, in the competition the last four weeks. So, so Jake Waterman from West Coast, his form has decreased more than any other player in the competition the last four weeks. But that's it. But the the next three are the big ones for me because they're all finals bound or in finals contention. So Jay Gresham has now been the lowest rated general forward in the competition for the last month. Mm. That's a that's a significant factor for St Kilda. They've got to get him up and going. Jeremy Cameron is now the 13th rated key forward in the competition the last month. And Tim English, which we spoke about before, Kane, over the last four weeks is now the 13th highest rated ruckman in the competition. So, 
So, you know, we, you know, we saw Wits sort of had the better of him. We saw Reeves um, and Meek have the better of him a couple I of weeks ago. I was measuring him for his All-Australian blazer a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, no, me too. I thought he was an absolute lock at about round seven or round eight. So, it's as you said before, Kane, it's quickly. Mm. It's, things, it's interesting how things can change very quickly in this game. So, Cameron, is he in the All-Australian side at the moment? He would still be in there, but he wouldn't want to continue on down this form for too much longer, mm. I wouldn't have thought. All right, let's get to some of your listener questions. Hoiny, this one, how is Geelong rating this season to the same time at last year? Yeah, so I said off the top that I don't think that they're going to be able to win it this year just because they're, you know, you know well, purely because of injuries and they're too far behind. But in terms of their profile at the moment, they're top six in the turnover game and they're top six in the stoppage game. So, they're turn so the their game isn't in horrendous shape. It's just I think they're just going to be too far behind to be able to seriously challenge. Where is it uh, hit yeah. most? Is it defending transition? It hits most in terms of what they've been able to do in D50 this year. So, we talked about them defending stoppages and their ability to be able to hold up down back. But, um, yeah, I think they're just going to be too far behind to be able to challenge this year. C can you please ask, if the pies are not as good as what everyone is saying, can you please ask us where we need to improve? Yeah, so this isn't a knock on Conley at all. I think Collingwood are the best team in the competition right now. It's just whether or not they can sustain that for the next 12 weeks in the competition. But why I'm so big on, on Brisbane compared to Collingwood is in terms of their stoppage game and turnover game, it is pretty much identical at mm. the moment. There is nothing between the two of them. So that's just why I'm saying I don't think the gap between Collingwood and the next best team is as big as what everyone else thinks. I still think they are the best team in it, mm -hmm. but the gap isn't as significant as what everyone else thinks, in Matt's my opinion. This one for you. Which team has the best overall forward profile so far? Is it Melbourne, given the turnover differentials? Yeah, so Melbourne, Melbourne's ability to be able to get scoreboard return is, is the best in the competition. Number one scoring team in the competition. Number one team had actually been able to score off turnover. But in terms of if you're looking, if you're measuring you know, the efficiency of each forward line at the moment, it is Adelaide who are the most efficient team at converting entries into score. And that was a large reason as to why they won that game on Sunday against Brisbane. Yeah, their forward line uh, is it's so multifactorial, isn't it? They've got the talls mm. and they've got the, the ground ball players and they're young and they're exciting and they're creative. And you compare it to Brisbane. And we did this uh, on the weekend, obviously. I mean, Brisbane has got Charlie Cameron and two or three other smalls that can mm. rotate through there. And they've and they've also got – well, Danaher has been rated the best uh, forward for the last eight mm. weeks or thereabouts. Probably Hipwood struggles, struggling a little bit, but uh, they look pretty exciting too. And, uh, and it's why I absolutely totally agree with, with what Damien Hardwick said a couple of weeks ago around draft picks. You've got no idea what you're getting with pick five, pick six, pick seven. So – for Adelaide to give up pick five for Isaac Rankin, we'll look back on that and go, that's a steal. Yeah. I mean, this guy this guy is a game changer and, and will be a game changer for Adelaide for the next 10, 12 years. So, um, yeah, no, they can get you in multiple ways. I like this text. I uh, would love Horny's thoughts and insight on Gold Coast defender Charlie Ballard. I feel he's on the same trajectory as GWS's Sam Taylor. His intercept marking is top notch and his ability to nullify the biggest and best forwards in the game could see him as an All-Australian in the coming years. It might come a bit sooner than the coming years for Ballard. I, I tell you what, if it keeps going at, at, at this rate, I reckon Kane's going to be in conversation uh, towards the end of this year. I mean, he he's on track at the moment to break the intercept mark record for a season. So, Why are we um, seeing more intercept marks? I, I noticed Gary Lyon was talking about this uh, on the couch. I think I think it's the willingness and understanding of, of what you can actually get going back the other way from the intercept game. And teams want to play a chaotic ground ball game. Mm. Well, you can kill the ground ball game by actually backing yourself to actually take that intercept mark. So, But it, but I think, you know, with that text as well, I mean, his ability to be able to take the main opponent each week at, at the moment is equally impressive. So he's not just playing that third man up role and getting those those cheap intercepts, if you like. His ability to be able to play on Aaron Norton on the weekend and still take four or five intercept marks is um, is what's standing out at the moment. Do you keep data on players that are tackled the most? Us, a listener, Rod, in fact. No, we don't. But what we do keep is is the amount of um, is the amount of disposals that are under significant pressure, and the and the ability to be able to use the ball under pressure, um, and who are those most most effective players in the competition. So I can I can bring that to the table next week uh, to be able to dive into that a little bit. But we don't record who gets tackled. There's an the unknown most. source named source here. Do you <laughs> record stats on missed push in the backs? <laughs> That's a very intelligent would question. Would that be Jared Ely? Let's That's a very that. intelligent That's question. <laughs> have, you, have you got a computer large enough? I Every time I'm listening to a Fox game and you're commentating and I see you push in the back, I just count down the seconds until you're going to mention the push in the back is dead. But there's, 
<laughs> it's um yeah no it is it's um it, it is quite bizarre isn't it it's at the moment dead what's if you're a that? forward on a defender mm. it's not dead if you're a defender on a forward so the the difference in the way the umpires interpret it is interesting